So I was very involved in the women's art movement. And I, in fact, I went to Rutgers University um, and got my, I was a, an undergraduate Douglas majoring in sociology. And then I went to Rutgers University to get my MFA. Um, I had started painting as a senior in college and um, took a year off, much to my mother's chagrin, to paint and to, um, you know, I worked part time making money. And then I got into Rutgers, luckily, um, for three years. They, they told me that I had to do one year non matriculated because I had never taken, really only taken one art course in my life. And um, so I got my MFA in three years. That's when I began to have a consciousness about the fact that, A, there were no female teachers in the art department at all. Um, and there were a, a lot of women you know, studying. And B, that I could never get a job there. And even, even years later, I mean, when I tried to get a job at Rutgers, I mean, it took many, many years before they started hiring women. I mean, it was a long time. One of the things that I did do that I'm really proud of is that in the early 70s, I decided that because there were no teachers at Rutgers and at Douglas, no, no women teachers, that the women students needed role models. The undergraduates, whether they were art students or not, they needed to see work by women. So I started the Women's Artist Series. It's now called the Mary H. Dana Women's Artist Series, and it, believe it or not, still going on. I mean, I, I have, I question whether it even should still be going on, but it is still going on. But in the very beginning of starting that series, and it really was the first women's art program in the country where women artists were shown and women artists talked about their work. Um, I remember like the first few years I curated the shows and I had Louise Bourgeois, I had Mary Heilman, I had, um, I think Pat Steer had a show, I had a show. Um, people who actually became quite well known after <laughs> years later, but um, you know, the first few years I did it, I would have the women come down to, to talk. And I remember the very first time there were like three or four students came, you know, and then maybe six or seven students came. By the third year, the place was packed, but, but it did take a few years. Anyway, we could go on and on talking about the women, you know, women in the art world, but let's talk about the work. Okay. I'm going to just narrate this sketchbook that I can't quite understand, but what Joan does is she plans her paintings in many ways, and they come through this process of keeping a sketchbook. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to talk about how I, um, where these ideas come from, or where my paintings come from, or my process, which is most often it begins with going to a concert. So I like to listen to a lot of music. Um, I'm more often found at a concert than I am at a museum or at a gallery show. Um, I'm more inspired by music, I think, than anything else. And I learn for, more from music than anything else, just listening to music. And when I work, I always listen to music. I mean, there's always something running and, and often when I'm getting into a certain series of paintings, I will listen to the same four CDs over and over and over again. But what happens is that I'll be at a concert and it's really just a place for me to be in a very meditative state. Um, and I'll have my sketch pad out and, and Needless to say, after 40 or 45 years of working, one thing does lead to another. It's not like something's coming out of the blue. Um, but I'll make a sketch, and then you can't really see this from where you are. But for example, this is a really, really detailed um, sketch that I'll make initially, 
And then I'll go back to it over and over and over again, many times before I make the paintings. So that my sketches are usually two years ahead of my paintings, um, sometimes more. Like this is a sketch for a very large sunflower painting that actually I haven't done yet. Um, I just did not do that this winter. I almost did it, but um, the initial sketch began in December of 2012. And then what I'll do is I'll say, every time I look at this, I'll date it like August 2014. Um, 2000, for February 2013, I say, yes, gorgeous. I mean, I always say, yes, 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 yes. And then I'll add ideas. I mean, if I have enough yeses on here, you know, at some point then I'm ready to really do that painting. And this sketchbook is just full of that sort of thing, you know, where I, I, I mean, I actually edit myself very carefully. Sometimes they look like, oh, you know, that happened quickly or overnight, but it's, it's just not so. I mean, they, I really think about these things. I make tons of notes about what I'm gonna do. Um, you know, sometimes it's, there was one note that I really liked that I was gonna read. I mean, sometimes it's, where is it? On this page. This is a painting that I had in my last show. It was called Requiem Redo. And I make notes for myself. It says, leave it there, which means don't touch that painting. And of course I do touch that painting. It says, so I have notes from December 25th. It says, rougher with flesh figure at bottom in earth with rosebuds for black symphony, blue drawn flowers, black glitter, black print, dark, yellow sunflowers in left middle corner as in photo placed. You know, I make tons and tons of notes for myself about one painting. Old black woodcut faces also look at stages of Our Lady of Brooklyn. That's another painting that I made. From early on, I always believed that there was such a thing as a female sensibility. You know, that, that our experiences are different, our bodies are different, our lives end up being very different. And if we're gonna write or make art, or it's gonna be different than what a man is gonna do. It doesn't mean that the sensibilities don't cross each other, because I think they do. I mean, I think there are plenty of men who have those sensibilities as well. But I do think that, you know, a lot of this dialogue was from the early 70s, which is that in the early 70s, minimalism wasn't speaking to us. Color field painting certainly wasn't speaking to me and, and to many of us. Um, there began to be a narrative element going on. There began to be an element of materiality. I mean, women were using materials in paintings. They were being autobiographical. They were telling their stories. They had no other way to speak. I mean, they were really, and, and I, I knew this because I became well known as a painter in the early 70s. So anytime a college needed a woman to come and speak to the students, I couldn't get a job at a university, but they hired me to come to Kansas and here and there and everywhere to speak to the women students. So you were a token. So I was a token, but I, you know, I made money. I mean, I traveled. I, I couldn't get a teaching job, but that was one way that I earned a living. And also it was interesting. So I would walk into a woman's studio and I would look, I would just walk in and I'd say, oh my God, that's incredible. You know, I would see things that were incredible. And the student would inevitably say to me, Really? But my teacher doesn't get it. Who's your teacher? My teacher's a man. I mean, of course your teacher's not gonna get it. It was a whole new visual language that was going on that, you know, as I traveled around the country, I began to see it, and I think that on the West Coast, I'm sure Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro began to see it, Lucy Lepard, you know, and then, and then it became a dialogue about what's going on. You know, what are we doing? What are we all, how come our work is somehow different than, than 
other work that's going on. Um, I mean, for me, that's how the whole dialogue began, because I, I actually saw it. I mean, it wasn't something that came out of the sky. I mean, I saw what was going on around the country. I do, you know, I do embrace um, the female sensibility. I embrace the fact that I'm a feminist. I, you know, none of that is hidden, but it's not something that I think about or I don't know. I mean, it's just... Meaning it's not a conscious agenda. It sort of bubbles up like a spring, like a wellspring that comes up over and over as a, as a kind of guiding... I mean, you're drawn to painting fragmented female body parts, perhaps, in, in, in various ways. And, that's, but, and that's, a, that's a real sensibility in terms of... I think it's part of my language. I mean, I think, I think that comes up. You know, I think it comes up just like you know, other things come up, um, you know, like the meditation squares. And um, yeah, I think, I think that that's part of, part of who I am, part of my language, part of what I've always done over the years. I mean, I was doing it in the late 60s. I was doing it. You did it. paint very figurative body parts for a while. Yeah. And, and some of them were sort of flat, almost like a Tom Wesselman mat. Well, I did that in graduate school, yeah. Those have never been seen. But they're they hiding reproduced. In, they're hiding in storage. Um, but I did. Yeah, Jenny knows the work. But there's a, there's a real flesh-like sensibility, even if you're not depicting the body, per se, that, that the paint becomes almost a, a metaphor for flesh in some way, that there's this tactility and sensuality and that uh, sensual materials produce you know, central for, central forms ultimately in the work. What was that? Central. Central materials produce central forms. Central materials produce central forms. Yes, I think. I don't know what that means. Um, well, but there's a, there, there there there's not um, the sensuality is through the tactility that comes through in the materials that that you're layering. Over and over again, there's this constant layering and reworking the surface, that the surface becomes bodily in some way as you rework it. I, I mean, I, I'm not a painter. I don't know. You tell me. No, I mean, you have to tell me because you're the writer. I mean, and you're the art critic. I, you, you know, you're the curator. I, I mean, all that is true. But that doesn't mean that I walk into the studio feeling that or thinking that. I walk in just as me, you know, in the morning and I go to work. And I listen to music and, and I look at my sketchbook and I, you know, there's lots of poetry in there and there's poetry in the music I listen to and, and, um, and it moves me and it, and it drives me. I mean, I, I'm kind of driven. Um, it's, you know, there is a kind of magic that happens. You, you don't, you can't always put it in words. You know, it's like, it's like you start a painting and, you know, it's slow process in the beginning. And then you just sort of have to go on automatic pilot. And my automatic pilot is this language that I've built up over many, many years. And the language serves me really well. You know, it's, and, and the vocabulary is huge. And depending on what I want to say or what I want to talk about, it's there for me. I mean, I'm really lucky. I mean, I don't, I don't, um, you know, I don't have painter's block or you know, any of that kind of thing. I mean, I do take sometimes a few months off between shows just to, just to uh, get over the whole business thing, you know, and the whole public thing and the whole, you know, whatever. But I can never wait to get back in my studio again. Because as Maggie tells me that I'm crazy when I'm not painting, <laughs> so I need to be painting so that I'm not crazy. Because when I'm in the studio, I really am much emotionally much more, I'm better. Did that help? Yeah, it did. You have this line that you said somewhere about how your work, I think it's written on a canvas or maybe a drawing, but that your work has been absolutely faithful to you. And, and that, that seems to embody That's what you're a, saying. Written in a woodcut. In a woodcut. Okay. Yeah. My work uh, has been absolutely faithful to me. And that's true. And I always remember that line. And, and it feels like a, almost a manifesto of, of, but also a real 
tenacity as well, a, a commitment on both sides between you and this thing you create. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody. Uh, a big thank you to Joan and Jenny.